So this morning, uh, we're going to be continuing in our study of Joshua, and today we'll be in Joshua chapter 3. Um, and I've titled today's message, Crossing the Jordan. Crossing the Jordan. Now, in case you weren't familiar with this book, with this story here, chapter 3 picks up right after the events of chapter 2. After receiving the report from the spies that Joshua, that he had sent to Jericho, Joshua didn't hesitate and he began to immediately make preparations to cross the Jordan and invade Canaan. Now, chapter 3 will tell us all about that and a few other events that occurred that time. But before we get into this chapter, it's important for me to mention that chapters 3 and 4 are essentially linked together. They, they're one in a whole. They're an entire story. Again, meaning that they're interdependently related to each other. Now, with the time that we have, I haven't quite figured out how to do two complete chapters in, uh, in our time here that we have together. So uh, what I decided to do is get to chapter four next week. But uh, when we do, when we go, do get there, I... I want you to keep this message fresh on your mind, and if you can't do that, then I just would encourage you to, before you come next week, to uh, watch this video again on, uh, on uh, YouTube or the audio on uh, iTunes podcast. That way you can just know what's going on before um, we get to chapter four. Well, as I mentioned, it's now time for the Israelites to finally cross over the Jordan and begin to possess the land that God had promised them through Abraham half a millennium ago. This people, this people group, this special people group, had waited 400 years in slavery in Egypt. They then spent... 40 years more wandering in the wilderness. And then Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 8 says that after Moses' death, they mourned for an additional 30 days. And so you can see that now they were ready to cross, to cross over into Jordan and begin reclaiming the promised land. However, before they crossed over, God, who is a God of order, provided them with instructions. Instructions that represented His Word. Thus, we're going to see how they will be guided by His Word and empowered by His Spirit. And so the message that I hope it becomes clear as we go through today's passage is, is this. The only way to achieve redemptive success before God is by following Christ, our leader and our Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, before we begin reading, let's pray and Ask the Lord to speak to us through his precious word. Heavenly Father, that time of worship was so great, so wonderful. And, and now as we come together as a church, we just want to sit at your feet in, in a continue, continuing time of, of, of worship, Lord, as we hear your word. Hear what you have to say to enlighten us, to teach us, to speak to us personally, and, and to speak to us as a church. There's just a lot going on in the world these days, not just in our lives, but also in our city, in our state, in our country, and just worldwide. 
I just pray that you will use us to be a light. Use your word to speak truth. Thank you for bringing us all here, Lord. And we do believe that you have us here for a purpose and a reason. So remove all distractions so that purpose can be fulfilled. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Empty us of all pride. And we want to hear from you now. We know we will. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. The Word of God says, Joshua started early the next morning and left the Acacia groves, Grove with all the Israelites. They went as far as the Jordan and stayed there before crossing. After three days, the officer went through the camp and commanded the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your guard your God carried by the Levitical priest, you are to break camp and follow it. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourselves and the ark. Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go, for you haven't traveled this way before. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, because the Lord will do wonders among um, among you tomorrow. Then he said to the priests, carry the Ark of the Covenant and go on ahead of the people. So they carried the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of them. The Lord spoke to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so they will know that I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the water, stand in the Jordan. Then Joshua told the Israelites, Come closer and listen to the words of the Lord your God. He said, You will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly dispossess before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergeshites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth goes ahead of you into the Jordan. I choose 12 men from among from the tribes of Israel, one man from each, for each tribe. When the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, come to rest in the Jordan's water, its water will be cut off. The water, the water following downstream will stand up in a mass. Stop there and just break down, dissect these verses I just read. So our passage begins by mentioning what Joshua did the morning after the spies returned from Jericho. Rising early, he and all the children of Israel prepared a camp on the bank of the Jordan River before they cross over. The officers or the leaders, they're ready. They're prepared to relay to the people the instructions they had received from Joshua, who had received them directly from the Lord. Now this here will be a familiar occurrence that runs through the entire book of Joshua. God gives his directions to Joshua, who in turn shares them with the leaders, and they deliver them to the people. That's what we see going on regularly here. Again, coming directly from God. And so after three days, these officers share specific instructions with the congregation, with the people of Israel. First, the people of Israel were to break camp and follow the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in the next chapter, or next couple, this chapter and chapter four, the Ark of the Covenant will be mentioned 
16 times. 16 times, my friends. It's called the Ark of the Covenant 10 times, the Ark of the Lord three times, and simply the Ark another three times. Now, for those of you who may not know, let me give you a very simplified description of what the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, if you'd like a full description, I encourage you to visit Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22. But let me just share real quickly a description of it. The Ark was a box of acacia wood that was overlaid with gold. In fact, gold lined the inside of the box as well as the lid. There were carved angelic beings known as cherubim that faced each other and lifted up their wings towards heaven in a posture giving glory to God. The ark at the time was known as the throne of God, the place where his glory sat enthroned between the cherubim. This box also represented the presence of God in the midst of the people. And so the ark going before the people was, to, was an encouragement to their faith, for it meant that God was going before them and opening the way. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, God had promised Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So without touching it, the ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests with poles that were to be inserted through the rings on either side, other side of, either side of the ark. Now, why not touch it? Now, there were rules against uh, touching the ark itself, but simply put, the ark represented deity the pure holiness of God and the priests, as well as the entire congregation, were the complete opposite of that. See, there must be separation between a pure and clean deity and an unclean and unholy fallen humanity. There's a stark difference there. Ever since... Man fell. Ever since we sinned, Adam, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, man has been separated by God because of sin. And it's, he sees, because he's a holy and pure God, he can't have anything to do with something that is filthy, unholy, dirty. And that's what we are. That's what sin makes us. So there has to be separation there. But here's the thing. The only way to achieve redemptive success before God is by following Christ, our leader and our Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll explain that more in a bit. But that's the only way to achieve redemptive success is through Jesus Christ. And so the officers then instructed the people in verse 4 to let there be space of about a thousand yards between them and the ark. The purpose of this distance is so that the entire congregation can have an undisturbed and clear view of the ark the Ark of the Covenant, and follow it wherever it goes. Nothing to get in the way, nothing to, to disturb that line of sight. Keep their eyes on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. Here God is teaching his people to keep, his eye, keep their eyes on him and not to be distracted by anyone or anything. 
everyone is to observe the direction the, of the ark and to follow it. The reminder is that they have not passed this way before. This was unfamiliar territory to them. They had never gone this way. This was completely new to them. They had not gone that way before. This here is an admission that God is the ultimate leader and that we're to follow him as his people, as his children. He is our ultimate leader. He guides, he leads, and we follow him. We have to keep our eyes on him. You see, friends, you see, church, he, God, knows the way. We don't. There are so many of you that's out there that haven't traveled this way before. You've never gone in this direction. This is brand new territory for you. Therefore, you must follow the way who knows the way. You must follow the way who knows the way. Now, this here anticipates the words of Jesus in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As Job says in Job chapter 23, verse 10, God knows the way I have taken. When he has tested me, I will emerge as pure gold. Again, my friends, he knows the way. If this new life as a Christian is, if this life as a Christian is new, you just gave your life to the Lord. And again, this is going to be unfamiliar territory for you. It's going to be hard. You've known one way your entire life. You've known the ways of the world your entire life. But now, this is a new way. So again, let me remind you, just follow the way, the way, the truth, and the life. He will guide you. He will instruct you. He will help you as you cross the Jordan. We're then told in verse 7 how God then shared a word of encouragement to Joshua, to Joshua. When Moses led the nation through the Red Sea, this miracle magnified Moses for the people. It lifted him up. Everyone was like, wow, Moses. And they recognized that he was indeed servant of the Lord. What we see here this passage that God would do the same thing for Joshua at the Jordan. And in so doing, he would remind the people that he was with Joshua just as he had been with Moses. So, both Moses and Joshua had received their authority from the Lord before those miracles occur occurred. But the miracles gave them stature for the people. You see, it takes both authority and stature to exercise effective leadership. If you want to be an effective leadership or a leader, it takes authority and stature. And this is what Joshua had. And so after giving this encouragement to Joshua, God once again directs Joshua to command the priest who carry the Ark of the Covenant to approach the edge of the waters of the Jordan River. And then what? It's to stand in it. Simultaneously, the placing of the feet on the river's edge will signal God's holding back of the flowing waters of the, of the Jordan, thus causing these waters to stand up in a heap and that attention while the children of Israel 
cross over dry, dry ground into the promised land. In fact, the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant are to go onto the middle of the Jordan River in the path of the waters standing at attention. The priests bearing the Ark serve as traffic personnel. Imagine those crosswalk, uh, school crosswalk people that, you know, keeping the cars away while the young children are getting to school. Now, the key to this entire episode, it isn't the priests or their feet touching the edge of the Jordan River. Now, one could create an entire sermon about feet touching the Jordan River, but it's not about that. It's the real key is that they're holding the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God in the midst of the people. See, the, the, the priests could have stood at the edge of the Jordan River without the Ark of the Covenant and their feet touching the water's edge. And the Jordan River would have kept flowing. The Ark of the Covenant my friends, that's what made the difference. That's what made the difference was the Ark of the Covenant. Here's the thing. We may preach, sing, and serve in ministry, in the ministry of the church, in all kinds of ways, but without God's presence in our midst and in our lives, you won't see the effective proclamation of the Word of God, the provision of God, or the power of God. We will, we will be simply going through the motions. When you, church, are picking up your Bibles here, and we read together, are you expecting to hear from God through His Word? Do you believe that every single word written in this holy book is God's word. Are you expecting to hear something from him? Again, whether it's from the Old Testament, whether it's from the passage we just read, whether it's from the New Testament, from the Psalms, anywhere, are you expecting to hear from God? wants to speak to you and we have to focus and keep our eyes on God but hear his word as well his word has power his word is what changes lives his word is what restores marriages cures addiction heals addictions he has the power to separate the waters of the Jordan, those waters that are keeping you from the promised land. Don't just simply go through the motion. Now we can see in these verses that God was providing for Joshua and the children of Israel. And it was also, it was a preview of coming attractions. They knew they would face the enemies. They knew they would face enemies that seemed formidable and cities that appeared impregnable. These cities, these people, were mighty, strong people. They were like giants to them. They were like state-of-the-art type people. They were advanced in every kind of way. And here again was just a group of Israelites who had been wandering through the desert without a home for 40 years. They knew that Canaan was inhabited by seven peoples, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. 
So the miracle, my friends, that took place at the Jordan River demonstrated that if God can hold back the river until all Israel had crossed over, then God, then God could defeat this sevenfold nation of Canaan. If he's powerful enough to do that, he could defeat all the enemies of Israel. If he, if God, raised Jesus from the dead, he can rescue you as well. He can save you. Church, these verses also show us that the Lord gave them all the information they needed to accomplish what he wanted them to do. You find conditions that the people had to fulfill, orders they had to obey, and promises they had to believe. See, God always gives his word of faith to his people whenever he asks them to follow him into new areas of conflict and conquest. God always gives his word of faith whenever you, he asks you to follow him into those areas that you've never been to before. Those areas that you think that you would be uncomfortable in. Those areas that you think that you'd never survive. He will give you his word of faith. And it's that that gets you, that will get you through, that will keep you going on and on and on. In spite of the obstacles, in spite of the adversities. You hold on to him. You hold on to his word and what he promises. He won't let you down, my friends. He will keep his word. Not according to your timing, but according to his perfect timing. Because his timing is always perfect. God's commandments are still his enablements. And God's promises don't fail. The counsel of King Jehoshaphat, centuries later, is still applicable today. It says this in 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20, Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. Trust in the Lord, and he will get you through those trials. His word never fails, my friends. Believe in God. He will establish you. All right. Next part of our passage is pretty lengthy. Well, actually, not lengthy. It's... Just a few verses, so let's read the rest of chapter 3 together. Joshua chapter 3, verse 14. When the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water at its edge. And the water flowing downstream stood still, rising up in mass. That extended as far as Adam, a city next to Z Zarathon. The water flowing downstream into the Sea of Arabah. The Dead Sea was completely cut off. 
and the people crossed opposite Jordan. The priest carrying the Ark of the Lord of the Covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now, I pretty much see a river every night that I go to work. But you got to understand, when I see this river, it's just a little stream. You know, and I, I remember when I was first a Christian, I, I would read this and I'd be like, well, how big was this river? Was it a big river? Was it a, a thick river? Was it a heavy river? And we find out that it was. It wasn't anything like the stream that I see every night at work. And during most of the year, the Jordan River was about 100 feet wide. But at the spring flood season, the river overflowed and overflowed its banks and became a mile wide. As soon as the priests bearing the ark put their feet into the river, the water immediately stopped flowing and stood like a wall about 20 miles away upstream near a city called Adam. It was a miracle of God in response to what? In response to the faith of a people. They believed he was going to do this. And they followed the ark. They kept, they kept their eyes on the ark, on God, the presence of God. And God came through and did what he said he was going to do. Friends, church, brothers and sisters in Christ, unless we step out in faith and get our feet wet, we aren't likely to make much progress living in living for Christ and serving Him. We must take those steps. We must get our feet wet. If you claim, if you proclaim to be a Christian, a follower, follower of Christ, are you following him at a distance? Are you staying at the camp? Or are you following? Are you obeying him? Are you doing what he says you ought to do? Are you living in those promises? Are you living out those promises? Are you stepping out? In faith, like he asked us to, like he exemplified so many times. Get your feet wet, my friends, our brothers and sisters. If you've never got your feet wet, now is the time. Now is the time to do it. You'll make progress. You will. You'll grow. Not only that, you'll grow as a believer, but your relationship to God will also grow much deeper. You will begin to trust in Him more. I think that's what we all want. Get your feet wet, my friends. Now each step that the priest took opened the water before them until they were standing in the midst of the river on dry ground. They stood there as the people passed by. And when the whole nation had crossed, the priests walked to the shore and the flow of the water resumed. Now Exodus chapter 14 tells us that when God opened the Red Sea, he used a strong wind and blew the whole night, that blew the whole night before. And from Exodus chapter 15, we know that this wasn't an accident, for the wind was the blast of God's nostrils. When Moses lift up, lifted up his rod, the wind began to blow. And when he lowered the rod, the waters flowed back and drowned 
the entire Egyptian army. When Israel crossed the Jordan River, it wasn't the obedient alarm of a leader that brought the miracle. They weren't being chased by an army. But the obedient feet of the people. The miracle, what brought the miracle was the obedient feet of the people. Unless we're willing to step out of faith and obey his word, God can never open the way for us. Let me repeat that. Unless we're willing to step out in faith and obey his word, those two things, step out in faith and obey his word, God can never open the way for us. For us. So by this great miracle, the crossing of the Jordan River at flood stage by a nation of about two million people, God was glorified. Joshua was exalted. Israel, the people were encouraged. And the Canaanites, I'm sure they had wet streams coming down below them. They were terrorized. They were scared. For Israel, the crossing of the Jordan meant that they were irrevocably committed to a struggle against armies, chariots, and fortified cities. They were all in now. They knew that's what they were going to be facing from now on. Armies, chariots, and fortified cities. But here's the thing, too. They were also committed to walk by faith in the living God and to turn from walking according to the flesh as they had done in the wilderness. As I had mentioned before, the crossing of the Jordan River isn't a picture of the Christian dying and going to heaven, contrary to what some have said in some songs. The crossing of the Red Sea pictures the believer being delivered from the bondage of sin. And the crossing of the Jordan River pictures the believer claiming the inheritance in Jesus Christ. It's claiming those promises, that promise of everlasting life. Again, think about it. If you think about it, it's, it's mind-blowing. The Red Sea, a picture of being free, delivered, freed uh, from the shackles of sin, And the crossing of the Jordan is claiming your inheritance in Jesus. Friend, Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ, our conqueror who leads us from day to day into an inheritance he has planned out for us. Let me show you what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But as it is written... What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived. God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. It says in... 47.4, he chooses us, he, God, he chooses us, our inheritance. Repeat that, he chooses for us, our inheritance. 
What a tragedy it is when God's people fail to claim their inheritance and wander aimlessly through life as Israel did in the wilderness. Had those people, had Israel had faith and been obedient, any time during those 40 years, they could have claimed that promised land. They could have entered that promised land at any time, but time and time and time again, they just showed their disobedience. They, sh they showed their lack of faith. Don't be like them. There's a great and amazing and beautiful inheritance that awaits you. Many times, I know this has been the case, this was the case for me for many years, I walked in disobedience. I walked in idolatry. I was unfaithful. God was saying, hey, you could have been doing this, you could have been doing that. I could have given you this sooner. I still believe without a shadow of doubt God has a perfect timing for everything. I wouldn't be where I'm at now had it not been for the things that I experienced. This is my testimony. This is my story. But I do often wonder, had I remained faithful and not walked away from the Lord so many years ago and walked away for 10 years, I wonder where I would have been, where he would have had me, what I would have been doing. I don't think about it too much again because it didn't happen that way. But one always wonders. I always wonder. Maybe you do too. It's okay. Don't be too hard on yourself. You're here now. If you are saved, if you are walking by faith, if you are being obedient, he has you here now. And you have to rejoice because you could have been somewhere else. You still could have been in the wilderness, but you're not. You've crossed over the Jordan and have claimed your inheritance. So continue to walk in it, my friends, my brothers and sisters. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the ways of the world. There's nothing there. There's nothing there for you. The heartache, heartache, sadness, destruction, sin, bondage. So don't fail to claim your inheritance. If you're a believer and have walked away, come back. Come back to the Lord. It's never too late. Stop wandering in the wilderness. The, the book of Hebrews was written to challenge God's people to go on in a spiritual maturity and not go backward in unbelief. In Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, the writer used Israel's experience at Kadesh Barnea to warn foolish Christians not to come short of all that God had planned for them. We never stand still in the Christian life. No. We never stand still in the Christian life. If you believe that, you're mistaken. We either move forward in faith or go backward in unbelief. We either move forward in faith or go backward in unbelief. Which way are you going? Which way are you? That's maybe a, a tough question for you to answer. But you must answer it honestly. Are you going forward in faith or going backward in unbelief? Having one foot in and one foot out 
is standing still. Just staying there, not doing anything. That's not what God wants for you either. So many great and amazing plans that the Lord has for each and every one of you. You could be the next youth leader in this church that brings revival in this city. You could be the next, you know, children's ministry leader that makes an impact into the life of that child. You could be the next greeter at the door that is giving a smile, a godly smile, a, a Jesus smile to somebody who's walking through those doors who maybe thought that this would be, maybe is thinking that this would be the last Sunday they were going to walk on this earth. You could be that person that God uses to evangelize this entire city, this entire state, country, to bring revival. You shouldn't be out there looking for fame or notoriety or looking for clout, looking to be YouTube famous, TikTok famous. No. What God wants to know you by is as his obedient child just doing what he calls you to do in his word simply this to share the good news of jesus christ by ministering to those family members that are maybe from a a, a different faith that are completely messing their lives up with drugs, with alcohol. No, it's, it's, it's just sharing life, the love of Jesus, living it out so they can see the light that's in you, the Holy Spirit that's working in you. God gets glorified that way. Friends, move forward in your faith. Don't go backward. There's nothing there. Let me start ending by saying this. This is what I hoped you would understand by the end of this message. The only way to achieve redemptive success before God is by following Christ, our leader and our Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit at his time, which is always on time. If you want to achieve redemptive success, Come to the cross. Come to the cross and lay your sins before Jesus and allow him to forgive you of all your sins. Some of you have been carrying these bags on your back, on, on your shoulders, your sin for so long, and it's been holding you down. It's been keeping you down, and you know it, you feel it. You've tried other things, but that emptiness is still there. That bag is still there. Jesus died on the cross to free you from that bondage, to free you of that weight. He's saying, give it to me. This is what I died for. This is why I'm hanging on the cross free you. I want to deliver you. I want you to enter into the promised land. 
that's what you'd like, if that's what you want to do, wherever you're at, I want to, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head with all your heart, with all sincerity. Pray this to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to please forgive me. I'm sorry for blowing it. I'm sorry for all that I've done. Please forgive me. I now believe that you died for my sins and three days later you rose from the grave. I truly repent. I truly repent of my sins and confess you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you. I, I, I accept your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for saving me. So now, Jesus, I ask you to fill me. Fill that empty place in my heart with the Holy Spirit. So that he may teach me and guide me and show me and reveal to me the depths of your love. In my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, please, please, please reach out to us. You want to hear your story. You want to hear how you prayed that, and maybe we can help you in your next steps, especially if you don't know what to do, where to go to next. Um, we can help you with that, um, but please contact us. Thank you again for joining us, for checking out this mess, this uh this live stream, look forward to seeing you. Be a blessing to others. Um, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.